Second bye week of the year, so it's time to take a minute. Let's reset. Let's evaluate. How good is this Tennessee football team? Where is this Tennessee football team elite? And where is this Tennessee football team do you got to get better? I think we can answer a couple of those right here. But we're going to dive down deep into the stats here. It's a Wednesday Locked On Vaults. You are Locked On Vols, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Vols, your Wednesday edition. I'm your host, Eric Kane, and uh, really happy to have you guys along for the ride, making Locked On Vols your first listen, your first watch each and every single day. Couldn't do the show without our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Today's episode, again, brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's FanDuel.com to go ahead and and get started today. We, we're going to get into a couple of different topics here. Jo- Josh Ward for Ward Wednesday. Good conversation about the Alabama game and, and and what needs to happen here over the bye week that's coming up in segment number three. But I'm going to take a look at the college football playoff percentages according to the ESPN Football Power Index here in segment one and, and kind of look at where Tennessee's been elite. And then in segment two, we'll discuss the offense where clearly Tennessee has got some work to do. What do the numbers say? And, and personnel-wise for Tennessee, Who's kind of done what so far? All that and more coming up here on today's show. So uh, what does the football power index say about Tennessee's chances of making the college football playoff? Well, it's pretty good. Uh, Tennessee, according to the college football power index, the FPI over at ESPN.com, Tennessee is ranked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th. I really don't like how they don't number these, but... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. six. Oh, see, right there, six. Six. With a 6-1 and one record, Tennessee has a football power index rating of 21.0, which is, it measures the team true strength on net point scale, expected point margin versus the average opponent on a neutral field. So if Tennessee were to play an average opponent at a neutral field, the football power index believes Tennessee is favored by 21 points to win that football game. Oh, here's the ranking. It's in another column over. Sixth. Uh, The football power index projects Tennessee's win-loss record to be, at the end of the year, 10.2 wins to 2.1 losses. So it looks like 10-2. and You know, that's something we talk about all the time with the, of course, you got to handle business. You needed to handle business at Arkansas, and you didn't. But you got Kentucky coming to town, Mississippi State coming to town, and then, of course, you hit the road for Georgia. That's the big one, UTEP, and then Vanderbilt at the end of the year, which Vanderbilt will be no gimme. So you got to handle business against teams that you're supposed to beat and then go down to Athens and and see, see where you're at, right? I mean, I still think where you know Tennessee's struggling right now, you can correct some of those things. I mean, look at the offensive line. Was it perfect? No. But is anybody complaining about the offensive line this week after Alabama? No, nobody's not because they played well. They, they, they improved. So if you can just con- – I talk, talked about it last week. If you can continue to improve from one week to the next – you're going to turn into a pretty good football team. And I know that's the goal for every football team in America. I get that. But uh, you kind of saw that in terms of the offensive line last week. So, you know, see what happens by the time you go down to Georgia and see if you can win that football game. The football power index gives Tennessee a 66.7% chance to make the college football playoff. So I thought before the season, and many people thought that if you're 10-2 and in the SEC, boy, you're pretty much a shoe in to get to the college football playoffs. I don't think it's as easy Right now, I think Notre Dame, if he continues to run the table, Notre Dame's going to be in on name alone, even though it had a horrendous loss. Uh, Big Ten, there are a lot of teams out there that are really good, but also ain't played nobody, Paul. I mean, look at that strength of schedule for the Big Ten. You could say the case for the ACC as well. There's some Big 12 schools who are, I mean, there's a lot of teams around the country that are still unbeaten or have one loss. And so in the Southeastern Conference, where it's kind of like the NFL model, where you're really just beating up on one another, there are going to be several teams that, that have uh, that ten and two record uh, by season's end, and um, I, I think it's going to be you know huge in terms of how you do, how everything plays out. The remaining couple couple of games on the schedule, you know, five to six games on the schedule, um, and I think there's going to be some real conversation there. And I think Tennessee is going to be right in the thick of it if Tennessee finishes with a ten and two record. Now, if Tennessee runs the table and finishes eleven and one, Tennessee should be in. And uh, you know, from the Southeastern Conference, I think that's um, is understandable. So a 66.7% chance to make the college football playoffs, it's still better than a 50-50 chance, so your, your percentages are good right there. It gives um, Tennessee a 17.6% chance to win the SEC, a 13% chance to make the national championship game, and a 6.6% chance to win the national championship. That is 
uh, the highest percentage in those two, making the championship game and winning the national championship, the highest percentage in those two categories that we've seen all season long for the University of Tennessee. What about the resume right now? Well, Tennessee right now has the... Let's see, strength of schedule, it's ranked 28th. Remaining strength of schedule is the 25th. Toughest uh, slate remaining in the in the country. Um, let's see here. The strength of record rank, which reflects uh, a chance that an average top 25 team would have t- the team's record or better given the schedule. Tennessee comes in ranked number 10 right there. I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but I guess my point is Tennessee is right in the middle of it. And if you would have said... Going into the second bye week, Tennessee, a 6-1 and one team, everybody and their mother would have taken that because that meant your loss, your one loss on the year, came NC State, Oklahoma, Alabama, Florida. Nobody would have said Arkansas, but still a lot of fans would say, okay, 6-1, and one, one loss heading into that second bye week the, ahead of the five games remaining in the season. You take that every day of the week. It's just kind of weird that that one loss came to Arkansas. So uh, still a whole lot to play for, a whole lot to play for. And we've talked about how the offense was close. We talked about how those down-the-field passes could have changed the game significantly. I mean, you know, on the other side of it, without Will Brooks' shoestring tackle for Jalen Milrow, man, that run could have changed the game significantly as well. So um, I think Tennessee's close. They got the offensive line gave you a lot more hope last week. And, of course, Dylan Sampson doing what he's doing along with that defense you're a pretty, pretty sound, pretty good football team. Uh, quickly here, uh, remainder here of segment number one, where's Tennessee elite? Well, you guys know Tennessee is absolutely elite on defense right now. The only team in FBS to rank in the top five nationally in scoring defense, uh, where it's 11.6, fourth best in the country. Total defense, fourth best in the country, allowing 259 yards per game. Third down defense, second best in the country, allowing opposing offenses to convert on 23.7%. And and listen to this stat. This stat is truly incredible for the Tennessee defense. Through seven games, Tennessee's defense has forced more turnovers, 11, than touchdowns allowed, eight. Uh, That's elite right there. Ranks second in rush defense in the country at 79 yards per game. Uh, Second in rushing yards given up per per carry at 4.03. Third in tackles for loss at 59. Sixth in red zone defense at 65.2. Um, the touchdowns given up in the red zone has been phenomenal. Okay. And 35%, which means when opponents are getting inside the red zone, Tennessee's defense are allowing touchdowns on just 35% of the time, eight touchdowns on 23 trips to the red zone by opposing offenses. That's not bad. Also, one of those is a give me touchdown there at Arkansas, but again, they still, you know, went down the field a little bit. Um, explosive plays, limiting explosive plays. So far this season, Tennessee's defense has allowed only three plays that have exceeded 30 yards or more. Uh, 21 of those plays came last football season. Uh, 19 plays Tennessee's given up that have exceeded 20 or more yards. That happened on 51 occasions in 2023. So you're limiting the big plays. You're being good on third down. You're being great in the red zone. And you're, you're, be, you're just deafening against the run. And that's why Tennessee's defense, you're continuing to build and seeing all these national ranks. So truly some incredible stats there for uh, Tennessee so far this football season. You hope it keeps up. And, uh, I mean, you, you just look at, you know, the personnel quickly here of Tennessee's defense. You lost your leading tackler. And I think that hurts, especially the rotation, because you're having to play some some guys you wouldn't want to play as much at linebacker. But the fact that Brian John Marie and William Inch both have been committed to playing young guys the past two seasons – Tennessee's ready for this moment, right? Um, you know, Keenan Peely's out. Arian Carter's been fantastic. Second on the team with 33 tackles. Second on the team with four and a half TFLs. That interception against Florida was huge. Jeremiah Tlander now the starting Mike Backer. Really good in the box. Really good communicator. Uh, very much a part of that rotation before the injury to Peely. Caleb Perry's role, he, I mean, he just not only is he just a package guy. Now, I've, I've told you, and I'm sure you've seen, um, he's the guy that goes in when Tennessee goes three backers. So a 4-3 traditional set when the opposing offense comes with two tight ends or 12 personnel uh, against Florida and against Alabama, Tennessee's countered that by taking Boo Carter out from the star, putting in Caleb Perry to run a 4-3, and then when they go base, which is just one running back, one tight end, Perry comes out, Boo goes back in for the 4-2-5. Um, but, but anyway, I think Caleb Perry's role is obviously growing. He's now the true backup for both Mike and Will. 
Um, Jalen Smith's playing a little bit more as well. I, I think the new look secondary has been great because you have two great corners. Two great corners, your mom McCoy and Ricky Gibson, who are fantastic. Boo Carter is getting better every single week. Will Brooks is one of the best stories in college football. He's certainly one of the best stories on the Tennessee football team. Leading tackler at 37 stops, plus two picks, two interceptions tied for with McCoy for the team lead. Both interceptions have been huge. A pick six against NC State and the interception to seal the victory over Alabama. That's been awesome. And, and I love the commitment to playing multiple safeties because Tim Banks did not do that his first three years here. Um, Brooks leads the way with 303 snaps so far at safety. Andre Turrentine is next at 279 snaps. Jacoby Thomas is next at 136 snaps. Christian Charles is next at 120 snaps. Those are all four guys playing safety. That, that is your safety rotation. Hats off to Tim Banks for letting that happen. And then, of course, that defensive line, what more can you say? 12 to 14 guys in that rotation. James Pierce. Nobody's running away stats-wise, but if you look at the stat sheet for Tennessee, across the board, everybody's contributing. A couple TFLs, sack here, sack and half here, three and a half TFLs here, force fun. You know, it's, it's up and down the line. I mean, James Pierce leads the way with nothing that's eye-popping at three and a half sacks and five and a half TFLs, but he's really come along the last three weeks. 25 quarterback pressures, which is Really good, according to Pro Football Focus. So, where is Tennessee elite? We know it. It is defense. Tennessee's played incredible defense. And because of Tennessee's defense, they're right in the thick of it. They have a 66.7% chance to make the college football playoff. How can that percentage grow? And how can more wins get on the scoreboard? And how can Tennessee become a better football team all around? You know it. I know it. The offense has got to come around. Let's look at the numbers of the Tennessee offense so far through seven games. We'll do that when we come back right here on Locked on Balls. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just like any other job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals like a professional that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively looking for a new job but might be open for the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit any other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses can get qualified candidates within 24 hours. Hire a professional like a professional on LinkedIn. 2.5 million small businesses are currently using LinkedIn for hiring. So why aren't you? Okay. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That is LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. To post your job for free, terms and conditions, well, they do apply. Bye week pulse, the second bye week. And if I haven't said this already, if we haven't discussed this, I, I love the way these bye weeks have been staggered. I mean, Tennessee, four games to begin the season, two cupcakes at home, one on a neutral site, and one away from Neyland Stadium. Bye week. I love that. Come back, reset, have a chance to recharge, go on the road to Arkansas. That's one you gave away. Bad game, loss. We know about that. But then you come home. Rivalry, rivalry game, <laughs> say that 10 times fast, against Florida against Alabama, and then you have a bye week. And obviously, Tennessee, two tough heavyweight battles. They found ways to win when offense clearly wasn't its best. Now you have a bye week to to stretch, reset, regroup, talk things over, and then you hit the home stretch. Final games of the regular season, home against Kentucky, home against Mississippi State, on the road to Georgia, home against UTEP, on the road to Vandy, uh, and, and then we'll see if Tennessee's a college football playoff team or if it's just going to a bowl game. So I love the way these bye weeks are situated. I think they've really, really helped Tennessee. And and I've said this a couple of times, and you every day, you you probably get annoyed by it by now. But, I mean, seven games into the season, you are who you are, okay? And that doesn't mean you can't evolve. That doesn't mean you can't get better. But seven games in, I said this going to the Alabama game, six games in, that's halfway through the season, you kind of have a good idea of who you are. And we know that Tennessee is a really, really sound, good defensive football team. We know that Tennessee has a solid running back and a guy that's going to make plays and find the end zone on the ground. We know overall the run game's pretty good. It's been the passing game and the overall efficiency of the offense that's been kind of this Achilles heel so far for Tennessee. But it hasn't come without some bright moments. I mean, against these cupcake teams that begin the season, we saw the explosive plays. We saw the -the over-the-middle passing. We saw... Tennessee look like what we thought Tennessee's offense is going to look like all season long. Okay. And and then the points have been few and far between. 
You have a young quarterback that's really struggling. I'll get into him here in a moment. We talk about him on every show, obviously. It's a quarterback. Um, you got a quarterback that struggled at points in times. Um, you have receivers that have not been helping him out. You have offensive line issues that we've talked about at, at length. But you've also seen growth. Uh, I'll continue to, to, to beat the table here about the second half against Alabama. Sure, Nico was bad in the first half. Tennessee's receivers were bad in the first half. The defense played well enough to keep you in the game, keep you in the game, keep you in the game. And then finally, in the fourth quarter, Nico makes throws to win you the game along with the defense. How about that? I love seeing the growth. I love seeing the maturation process process of a young quarterback. I love that. Um, and, and if he can take where he finished the Alabama game, watch the tape, review, all that type of stuff, and, and move forward, I truly think that this that could be a turning point. That second half against Alabama could be a turning point in the career for Nico, who I think still has unbelievable talent. I still think he's got so much potential. And anybody saying that he stinks or he's a bust or he's no good, think about previous quarterbacks were here, guys, and think about if any of those guys sprinted out to the right and threw a 55-yard dart down the sideline on a dime. I can't think of any. Maybe they could do it, but we never saw it. Think about those quarterbacks that, you know, down for the third time in this football game in the fourth quarter, you throw a 16-yard, just beautiful raindrop into the back of the end zone for a diving Chris Brown. So how many quarterbacks have done that? Not much. My, my, my point is, it's going to come with some lumps. And we knew in this era of name, image, and likeness with his deal being known to public knowledge because his lawyer leaked it out there to get more business, we knew that the first interception, the first bad game, everybody would be coming fires and pitchforks and, and, and you know, we'd be, we'd be upset about it. Oh, he's a bust. Oh, what, what, a, what a waste of money and all that type of stuff. We knew all that. But still, it's not fun when it happens. Uh, but like every other qu young quarterback, you got to go through some growing pains, and hopefully he's going through those growing pains. So, some specific examples here, man. Um, Nico down the field passing throughout the season. And again, I, I as critical as I am about Nico, I hope you guys know I'm trying to be fair. I was, I've, I've been very critical of Tennessee's wide receivers, especially in the Alabama game. I did not think Tennessee's wide receivers played well. Um, I thought they responded well, just like Nico did. Um, but a couple of drops really hurt Nico when he was throwing good balls, you know, but 10 of 32, 31%, 10 of 32, 31% on passes 20 yards down the field so far on the season. That's not a good percentage. Those completion percentages are going to be down compared to his other throws, obviously, because they're, they're harder, longer throws, but that percentage has got to go up. It's got to go up uh, significantly. Um, on the season, he's thrown for 1,413 yards in seven games, eight touchdowns, four interceptions, 63%. Okay, 63% is not a bad number. You wish there was more than eight touchdowns. Four interceptions isn't horrible, but you really wish he had more than eight touchdowns. He's also rushed for 257 yards before sacks. That's third most on the team. Um, but here's those mistakes we're talking about here, okay? Um, he fumbled once in the red zone on the opening possession of the – I need to change that. I put Alabama game. That would be the – Florida game, I am uh, editing and doing a live show or doing a, a show right now at the same time, multi-talented. Um, he fumbled on the first possession against Florida. That stinks. Um, he fumbled twice while getting sacked in a game against Oklahoma. I'm not going to put all the all the fault there. I mean, obviously your tackles got beat. All four of his interceptions really can be chalked up to just dumb decisions in my opinion. Yeah, the interceptions count. I'm not trying to take that away, but just dumb decisions. NC State stared down a receiver in triple coverage, threw it, picked off. Um, he was clobbered when he should have ate the football. Should have ate the football, taken the sack. He was clobbered against NC State. Ball pops up, pick six. That's two of them, okay? Um, interception against Florida, same situation as NC State. Boy, he was staring down that wide receiver, staring him down, double to triple coverage, throws it in there, picked. And then the Alabama game, we talked about it enough, right? I mean, he just had all day long in the pocket, great protection. Finally, after six or seven seconds, it felt like he's flushed out of the pocket. All he has to do is step out of bounds. All he has to do is throw it out of bounds. He gets hit with his throwing arm, and he's trying to – I don't care if he's trying to throw it out the back of the end zone at that point in time. You had 10 seconds before to get rid of the football. Um, regardless, if he was trying to hit Boo in the back of the end zone or throw it to the second you know, row of the bleachers – he got hit while throwing. It was an interception. It was costly. That was a red zone turnover, just like the fumble for um, Samson there in the first half or, or, or on the first drive, a red zone fumble. That's not great. He, here's something to pay attention to as well. And I know this is like Paolo and Nico moment. Again, I'm, I'm always the caveat is he's – I'll get to that in a moment. Um, 
you can tell I love doing what I do for a living because I just got so much to say. Uh, in in six power four games, this is not a good stat, okay? In six games against power four competition throughout his career, Iamaliava has thrown for 200 yards or more one time. That was against NC State. Now, sometimes the games dictate it, right? Oklahoma game plan dictated that. Really, Iowa's game plan dictated that, his very first start. Um, and the defense was just owning the owning the field. But um, one time, he's thrown for more than 200 yards and six power four starts. That's not a good stat. That's got to change. That's not a good stat. But again, he's shown he can throw a ball and fit it into a tight window. He's shown that he can impact the game with his legs. He's shown that, um, gosh, he's got an arm. He's great out of the pocket. We've seen glimpses. We, we have seen why he's so hyped. That throw... That throw to Dante down the sideline on the sprint out and then the, uh, the the touchdown later in the fourth quarter to Brazel, those two plays are what all the hype's about. Okay, so we've seen that. He just needs to continue to build on that for sure. Last thing here on this uh, on the offense, let's go to a positive, uh, more so than the, the, the up-and-down quarterback play, Dylan Sampson. Dylan Sampson, there's not many things we can talk about being elite on the offensive end of the football this year. Dylan Sampson's been uh, gosh darn near elite. 838 yards leads the SEC. That's 10th most in the in the nation. 144 attempts, though, easily leads the SEC. He has been a workhorse for Tennessee. 17 rushing touchdowns, six more than Jalen Milrow, who's second in the SEC at 11. That is tied for second nationally in rushing touchdowns. Dylan Sampson also tied for a modern day record for single. Uh, single season touchdowns for Tennessee rushing touchdowns. So he's having a great year. Um, he needs to keep that up. Needs to get it going in the first half, but he's having a fantastic year. So by week pulse, defense elite so far. Offense has shown glimpses, has struggled, <laughs> has not scored enough, has not protected enough, um, has turned the football over uh, uh, you know, too much for a young quarterback. But... Again, there's 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 been glimpses, and there's been against cupcake teams, and is what it is. They they've been flat out dominant, but there's been glimpses in conference play, and, and there's enough, in my opinion, from the offensive line standpoint against Alabama for the entire game, and the rest of the offense in the second half, that I think you can build off that, and and, and in turn, you couple all three phases together, and you're a pretty good football team right now. You can be so much better. You can be so much better. And and you never want to hit your stride midseason. You want to hit your peak towards the end of the season heading in the playoffs or in the playoffs, right? 2022 Tennessee baseball style, right? And I think Tennessee's continuing on that steady climb. Not where it needs to be altogether, but it's going to get there in my opinion. All right, uh, Josh Ward, what does he think about all this? What does he think about the Alabama win? And what does he think Tennessee needs to um, focus on during the bye week? All that coming up on our Ward Wednesday segment right here on Lockdown Balls. I want to tell you guys about my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. It's America's number one sportsbook. So, when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out all the latest stats, view the live play-by-play, -play, and so much more, all on the same page where you place your bet. So, to get started, you're going to get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet, only at FanDuel Sportsbook. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That ain't bad, right? College football Saturdays, totals, first half spreads, props, all that and more. So much that you can do on Saturdays. So much that you can do on Sundays and throughout the week. NBA season's right around the corner. Actually, I think opening night was last night. It's this week sometime. Um, hockey's to follow. <laughs> We're about to be booked up, everybody. We're about to be booked up. And you can put some coin in your pocket and have some fun doing it over at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel, where you can make every moment more FanDuel. It is America's number one sportsbook. Josh, big win over Alabama. Anytime you beat your rival, that is worth celebrating. Tennessee's in a pretty good spot now heading into the second bye week. What's the reaction on the radio been like this week on Josh and Swain? Really good. Really excited. A lot better than after the Arkansas game, as you might imagine. A lot better, I would say, than after the Florida game because the Florida game was an overtime win against a team that the balls were huge favorites against. Now beating Florida and Alabama and seeing that path to the playoff look a little cleared out for Tennessee. It's not a lock that Tennessee gets there even with a 10-2 and record. But Tennessee beating Alabama, winning back-to-back -back home games against the Tide just as they've done with Florida from 2022 to 2024, 
I think has rejuvenated the fan base to believe that this program really is at a high level, ready to win an SEC title, ready to make a run at a national championship. We're not really hearing that yet, but believing that, okay, the structure of this program has been solidified. That's a big deal. Plus the goals that Tennessee had at the beginning of the season are very much intact. Man, nobody wants to talk about the defense. The defense is the only reason that Tennessee's in those conversations. It's not Josh Heupel. It's not Nick, uh, Nico Imaliava. It might be a little bit of Dylan Sampson. He's having a fantastic year, but it's the defense. Defense isn't sexy. I think it's sexy, but everybody wants to talk about the offense, and rightfully so. I thought Nico grew up in the second half. Uh, you were watching the game, a row behind me in the press box. You know, he was for, for as off as he was in the front, and he still missed some in the second half, and Tennessee's receivers didn't help him. He made a couple big time throws, some big boy throws, mm -hmm. that along with that defense got Tennessee in the win column. Yeah, they did enough in the second half. You're right. The defense held on again. That's what's had to happen the last few weeks. They held on against Arkansas, and then it's just that uh, in the end, but you don't need me to go through what happened. They held on against Florida, and then against Alabama, Tennessee's defense backs against the wall again. So think about James Pierce forcing the turnover against Graham Mertz a week ago. If that doesn't happen, I don't know that Tennessee wins the game. If Jermon McCoy doesn't pick off that pass in the end zone, I'm just not really sure why Jalen Milrow threw it, but he did. And McCoy picked it off, and that kept Alabama from getting in the end zone. Eric, uh, we can look at it for a couple of different reasons. One, if Alabama scores there and they have, let's say, a 14 to nothing lead at halftime, I don't know if Tennessee can just score enough to catch back up with what Alabama would still do in the second half. But also, the mental part of it, there has to be a difference going into the half as bad as the offense had been down three to nothing a week ago, down seven to nothing against Alabama. If it's 14 to nothing, and the offense is thinking, okay, we really have to turn it on. And the defense is thinking, how many more stops are we going to have to be asked to get? I don't know that it's there mentally. So they they have shown the toughness to stay in there, not give up on offense. And the throw down the, the right sideline, third down, coming out of a timeout to Dante Thornton, who made a great catch on his fingertips, is just a terrific play. So Tennessee made the plays it had to. Bama was not able to come up with enough, and Tennessee got out of there with a win. Which throw was more impressive? Both were just gorgeous. One was obviously probably a little bit more tough, tougher to make, but both were just amazing throws. The touchdown to Brazel or that throw you just referenced, both different throws. The one to Brazel, it was a slot fade. I love the, I love Hypo and Halsey putting Brazel in the slot for that one play, and he just yeah, you know, over the defensive back in a in a pocket, you know, just right back there, and then of course. The other one you referenced, sprinting out and throwing on the run down the down the uh, down the sideline. Yeah, I brought up to Swin on Monday's show. Brazel's in that spot where we don't typically see him. Now at that point, Squirrel White's out of the game, so maybe that's a, a factor with the personnel and where they're lined up. You said one throw maybe is tough. Which one do you think is tougher? Which throw? To throw um, well, to it's funny because you can make an argument for either one. I would say from a, from a physical standpoint, it's sprinting out to your right and throwing it fifty five yards on a rope. Um, yeah. but the precision for the other one, ooh. I see, I, th I think it's that one for this part of the conversation in general, what Nico did rolling out, running on the, on the run, delivering the ball where he did down the sideline, that should be considered the tougher throw. But I wondered, did that help him? Because we had seen his inaccuracy, his, um, his issues throwing, overthrowing receivers from the pocket, even when he had time to throw and had proper protection so in that spot another third down throw to Chris Brazel having to deliver it right there there is no margin he can't loft it over and the receiver can just keep running running and get it he had to put it in a spot Brazel makes a great catch on the football as well in that moment I think that's maybe the tougher one but they're I mean they're the reasons Tennessee won the game they or at least they allow Tennessee to win the game considering what the defense did as well but uh, we can't sit here and say the offense is fixed. We can't sit here and say that, okay, everything's good moving forward. We'll see if they can keep it going in the first half against Kentucky here in a week and a half. But uh, it has to be great for Nico mentally. It has to be great for a guy like Chris Brazel, who had the long touchdown catch against Kent State. He's not counting that. He knows how easy that was to beat the defender on that kind of play. A big catch in a big game. Brazel had the one on the sideline, which I'm sure he thought he should have had. Uh, earlier and, and didn't mm -hmm. come down with it. So big for Nico, big for Brazel. They have to improve. There are still areas that they have to get better. But doing that, having made plays and a win against Alabama should help. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I I pride myself on being critical when it's when it's warranted, right? I mean, I recognize how big of a win this is. It's a huge win. Um, Tennessee's in a great spot, okay? I say all that. But, like, yeah, as you said, the offense isn't just fixed. But, man, like, as critical as I am at points in times, I've, I've left each of the past two games like, dude, like, it is so close. Like, it is – your offense is there. Scheme is not broken. Second straight week, you have receivers yeah. running clearly behind secondaries, okay? I mean, they're they're open. Scheme's not broken. Nico can't hit them. Or Brazel, Brew, Squirrel can't make a catch. Like, I mean, the whole thing was out of sync. Nico was bad. Receivers were bad. Yeah, Brew's drop in the end zone. Very surprising. Yeah, and, and I thought Brew played a really good game. Brew also made a couple sure. of tough catches there uh, to bail Nico out of. Uh, Nico was missing high all game. Uh, th their game plan was to hit Brew on the slant. They went to Brew on the slant repeatedly in this game but anyway very Smart. surprising yeah so but like I'm still encouraged because I'm like gosh man like Tennessee should have scored 40 I know Nick Saban's not on that sideline Tennessee should have scored 40 against Alabama so if you can just hit one or two of those if you're so close like this really could be a well-rounded really good football team and that a defense again is to praise because they're keeping you in games they're winning you games allowing your offense to catch up yeah um it, you're right it it those throws were there. The opportunities were there. Of course, if we continue to see them miss, then we, we can come back to, well, should the expectation be that they're going to hit? I mean, maybe, again, we'll find out in a couple of weeks. If, again, we're scratching our heads at halftime saying, man, those guys are open down the field, but they're not connecting. Like, you're not going to hit every single one of them, but, like, sure, they're, hit, they're, hit they're low percentage them. throws, you know, really by just definition of knowing spots on the field, but yeah. they've been even lower percentage so far for Nico and these wide receivers, but they've got more time to work on it on the practice field. And again, just from an, you know, a mindset standpoint, Nico has to feel better. I, ha I have to imagine that he does coming out of that win against Alabama. And then there's also the aspect of his running ability, making plays with his legs. We've talked about the importance of incorporating that in the offense. That was a big part of what they're able to do at times, the plays he was able to make on the run. Uh, on the run as a thrower, and on the run as a runner within the offense, there's, there are still so many ways that Tennessee can tap into scoring more points. And if that happens with this defense, that's a big deal. Of course, the biggest game remaining is at Georgia. It'll be tougher to do down in Athens than it probably was at home against Alabama this past weekend. But Tennessee can build off what it was able to do in the second half. And to their credit, again, they've stayed in it. They have made enough plays. Offensively, they did more against Florida in the second half. They did more against Alabama in the second half. They need to put it together for four quarters. Josh, last time Tennessee had a bye week, you came out, dropped one on the road. I know you're not going on the road when you're done with this bye week, but how do you win the bye week? If you're Josh Hoppel, what are certain things you are, or, or maybe certain players? Like, example, I am having Mike Matthews line up in the slot every single snap over the next two weeks of practice. Like, he is going to be a slot receiver every single rep of Indy, every single rep of one-on-ones, of team, of 11-on-11. I'm getting Mike Matthews polished and ready to roll in the slot. Not saying he's going to play 50 snaps there, but it's pretty obvious right now. Squirrels beat up, but they only trust Nimrod there in the slot to play the duration of the game. Mike Matthews got to see the field. So for me, it's working Mike Matthews in the slot. For you, what does Tennessee need to work, rep, and focus on over the bye week? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm surprised we haven't seen more of Mike Matthews at this point. Like time he missed in camp, I don't. How much should that factor in? They've already had if, one if, bye if week. You're, if he's not getting more than five snaps right now, with Squirrel beat up, Brew yeah. limited, Dante Thornton limited, I mean, is he ever right? Right. Yeah, I have I have too much trust in his talent, and he was here in the spring. It's one thing if he was a summer arrival yeah. and just didn't get much practice time, but uh, that's a good one. Part of it is is just making sure you have the proper buy and your leaders are staying involved and making sure everybody's focused. And I say that because Dylan Sampson had the comments after the Arkansas game about maybe being lackadaisical during part of the bye week where they were preparing for Arkansas. A difference, of course, is Tennessee getting ready for a home game against Kentucky as opposed to traveling to Arkansas. That That's more of just what happens a week from Saturday. But making sure that everybody is, is staying bought in, offensive line uh, continuing to work. But yeah, defensively, it's difficult to say there's there's a whole lot to work on, but I'm sure Tim Banks is finding some things where there were opportunities for Alabama. We've talked about Tennessee's offensive opportunities. There were opportunities for Alabama's offense to hit some shots. Ryan Williams was missed when he was open. I think uh, they threw to him too often, and they could have gone somewhere else and hit some plays, and those are Alabama's issues to worry about. But Tim Banks is going to look at film and say, well, if they'd done this, if they had tried that, 
that could have been problematic for us. So I think those are some of the things, some of the conversations the coaches are having this week and next ahead of the Kentucky game and the final month of the regular season. Look, Milrow and Williams were just trying to pull their Hooker to Tillman connection at Pittsburgh in 2022. Hooker went to uh, Tillman, I think, 22 times in that game. Mm -hmm. And 19 times was Ryan Williams targeted eight receptions the other day. That's Yeah, I mean, here, here's an example I'll give. On the back-to-back -back plays when Williams is lined up against Gibson, second down, Ricky Gibson, he does grab his shoulder, whatever. Third down, they go back to him again. It just doesn't stand a chance. I think if he throws to Jeremy Bernard there, I think there's a good chance for completion if the ball's on target, because that's another conversation Bama has mm -hmm. to have. Milrow was just off, but there was a chance there. Uh, again, Williams on – was that the second to last drive where he's in the middle of the field and Milrow just can't connect with him. So th those are examples th those are going to happen in any game, but to the coaching staff, that's going to matter a lot. Josh, what's coming up the rest of the week and then on into next week as we continue on through this bye week no football game this week, but uh, plenty of action going on at Josh and Swain. I know it's about to be your favorite time of the year. Yeah, Josh, not a big football guy. Josh, big basketball guy. And that's a little yeah. exhibition play coming up on Sunday. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not a real game in terms of the uh, the win loss record for the season, but you play a real opponent uh, in an exhibition game this weekend, and Tennessee has a team that has legitimate goals, just like last year, to try to win an SEC title. Bama and Auburn being the top contenders there will make it fun, uh, and there's a lot on the table. So this this is a great time of year with the blending of sports. I love it. We're talking about Tennessee's opportunity in November, the playoff, an SEC title game appearance is very much on the table as an opportunity. Uh, we're talking about on the show twelve to three every day. And then we have the Josh and Swain newsletter free into your inbox on Friday morning. Josh, as always, man, thanks so much. You got it. Thanks, Eric. That is Josh Ward, a little segment we like to call Ward Wednesday, every single Wednesday right here on Lockdown Balls. Go ahead and sign up for the Josh and Swain newsletter. It is in the show notes of this episode. All right, good show today. Had a whole lot of fun. We'll continue breaking down Tennessee at this point in the season. How can Tennessee get better? How can Nico get better? All that and more during the bye week and how Tennessee needs to win the bye week and come out uh, you know, best foot forward against Kentucky next weekend at Neyland Stadium. Appreciate you guys as always for tuning in. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. This is Locked On Balls.